Well, good evening to you tonight. Welcome on this Wednesday night. Um, we are just a couple weeks away from time change. I don't know if you know that or not. We haven't said anything. We'll mention that to you this Sunday because this will be the last Sunday that you get to sleep in a little bit, all right? The following Sunday, which will be March the 12th, will be time change. But we're going to tell you now because sometimes you have to have those reminders. But nevertheless, you just see the day, you see the days getting longer. But glad you're here this evening on Wednesday evening. And um, appreciate Pastor Steve filling in for me last week in my absence. And uh, he's at, uh, up at the Cove uh, this week with a uh, board retreat. He is part of uh, the Florida Baptist Foundation board. Uh, I get to serve on our state board of missions, and, and then um, he gets to serve on the Florida Baptist Financial Services board. So they were having their retreat up at the Cove this, this week. Yeah, I know he's suffering up there. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, they'll be back this weekend, and I'm glad he got to be, they got to do that. But I'm glad you're here. We have students across the street. Our Spanish ministry has already been happening earlier today with the Bible study and then tonight and our children and ladies' ministry, and you're here, men's Bible studies. So things happening all over the place. Um, and so it's a good time, good time. Tonight we're going to look at the book of Haggai, and uh, so I'm glad you're here. Alan is going to lead us with Miss Wright accompanying, and I pray that you will sing together tonight. I hope you got a listening guide over there. There's also a midweek update if you want to know anything um, we try to include that, so make sure you pay attention to that. There's some things on there that may concern you on the outside, on the front cover, and then certainly prayer requests and things on the inside you want to pay attention to. Let me open us tonight as we pray together and then sing together. Lord Jesus, thank you on this Wednesday evening, the opportunity that you give to us in this midday of our week, our calendar, recognizing we began this week together giving you thanks knowing that we were going to start this week on the calendar, praising you, honoring you, declaring that you're worthy, not knowing anything about the days that were going to happen, um, any moments that were going to happen, because we trusted that you were worth that and that you're the one who's going to walk us through anything that we might face. And here we are. We've made it to this point, and uh, it has not been without adversity in some it has not been without trials or tribulations. It's not been without joys, and I'm thankful for that because in this room tonight, there are those who gather in here, and they have loved ones who maybe are struggling in areas or suffering, and their hearts are heavy, and yet I know there are some who gather tonight who are celebrating the joys of new life, uh, new grandparents, and I just thank you, Lord, that we get to celebrate together. And I pray, Lord, tonight as we look at one of your servants that you gave a word to write to people long ago, we find application in our own lives today. May we sing to you tonight and worship you through song, through our praying, and through our studying of the word. And we'll give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Alan? Well, before we sing these first two hymns, which are about singing, read you this, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it after I read it. Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing Him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing, and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve here and reward you when he comes in the clouds of heaven. That was written in 1761 by Charles Wesley in his preface to a hymn that he edited called Preface of Sacred Melody. And those are good words in 1761 and those are good words in 2023. <laughs> So let's do that tonight as we sing these great songs about, as, as a testimony to song. Here we go. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in all of my seven flow, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Singing as I go, all my life. 
was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken streams, stirred the sovereign chords on the third verse, feasting, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting beneath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smile. will mention this, but a big theme in Haggai, the best I can do <laughs> on that pronunciation, is uh, rebuilding, rebuilding, and uh, keeping at the, keeping your focus on the work, and we're going to sing some songs about what are you building your life on? If it's not built on, you think about the parable, the wise man and the foolish man, friends, he built his house on the rock, so let's do the same. Sing the solid rock and how firm a foundation. Thank you, Miss Mary.
didn't get a listening guide you can grab one if you need some coffee or refill grab that as well thank you roger each week for making that for us and um if you need instructions on how to find haggai <laughs> all right you can do two things one you can go to the table of contents in your bible and if you can't find it there or if you don't want to do that then find matthew most people know where matthew is and then just turn back left a few pages, because you'll find Haggai there. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Before that, Zechariah, and then right before that, two little chapter letter 
of Haggai, the book of Haggai, written about 520 B.C. So here we are. Now, after this, we've got three of these left, um, two more in our kind of chronological and canonical order, uh, Zechariah and Malachi, but we also have the book of Joel. And uh, so we have three of these left as we will finish up these minor 12 uh, that we've looked at together. Uh, tonight, this from one who lived in exile and returned from exile as a remnant, uh, likely lived in Jerusalem, and he's going to be a word of encouragement to those that are reading this uh, letter, this book. I want to read something from you that's not original with me. It's actually written by, uh, I believe, Warren Wearsby, but it really helps to set the historical context. I, I didn't give it to you. I, maybe I should have, but I didn't. So I just want to ask you to listen for a moment, just if you can envision, and then we'll kind of connect some dots uh, as we read through this. In order for us to understand that these last three writers, Haggai and then Zechariah and Malachi, those last three, we have to remember a bit of Jewish history. And I know none of us were alive back then, but let's just think about it for a moment, what we read about and what we've learned as we study through Old Testament. In 536 B.C., the book of Ezra reminds us that Ezra took 50,000 Jews from Babylon and was allowed to return back to Israel. 536, allowed to return back to Israel. And they began to rebuild the altar and they begin to start sacrifices again. And in 535, they lay the foundation for the temple. But not everybody likes when good things start happening, right? Somebody always wants to throw cold water. When God's at work, somebody's always got to be critical about it, right? So criticism happens, and the work begins to stop. And it's not until 520 that the people began to work again, and when we get to about 515, the temple is finally completed. And it is the work of these men that Haggai mentions that are going to be an integral part of the completion of that temple. We'll look at those men, um, and we might say his name is just Zerubbabel, right? <laughs> That's how we might say it, uh, or something like that. But if you, you try to put that first B with the first two syllables, so Zerubbabel, something like that, right? And then you have Joshua, who's the governor, and then Joshua the high priest, and then you have Haggai, and you have Zechariah, two prophets that are during that time. But let me just remind you, you don't have to turn there, but let me just remind you, because this is what Ezra says. It says, when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who was over them, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, or Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. This is what's happening in the book of Ezra. This is what Ezra is telling us is happening, and Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries of what's happening in that very moment. So Wiersbe goes on to say this, the whole purpose of Haggai's ministry was to awaken lazy people and encourage them to finish what the Lord had given them to do, and that is rebuild the temple. It was easy to get the work started and when they first came back because everyone was dedicated and enthusiastic, but after months of trial and opposition, the work began to lag and stopped. And you know, like I know, it's much harder to get the work started again than it is to start it initially. Now, I can tell you that because here's what I know. I remember, I told you about those days of helping my papa on the farm, right? You know, my stories of picking peaches. Well, that was always early in the morning. I mean, that was the first thing we did was pick peaches because we ate breakfast and we were in the peach orchard by 7 a.m., if not before that. And the first thing we did was get all the peaches and the nectarines out of the way, and then we headed on to what was the next thing. But I can promise you, the worst part of the day for me was not getting started in the morning. The worst part of the day for me was getting started after lunch. You hear me? That was the worst part because on those hot summer days after we left the peach orchard and we typically might go to the cornfield and we would pull, I can't tell you how many bushels of silver queen corn 
or we might have to do the worst job ever known to man in farming, and that is cut okra. I mean, that's just absolutely insane. Amen. I'm just telling you. Or we might have to load up watermelons and cantaloupes. I'm telling you, by the time it came to be lunchtime, I was drenched, and he was drenched as well. And he would say, hey, we're going to stop by Carter Burgers and get us a chicken box, all right, for lunch. And I was all for that. But I knew after lunch it was just going to be tough, right? Everybody knows how hard it is to restart. Wearsby says it's harder to get the work started again than it is to do it initially. And in this little book, we got four sermons from this prophet Haggai. And each of these sermons is dated. And each one he points out to maybe a particular moment or a particular sin that keeps them from accomplishing the Lord's will and finishing his work. And we want to look at that tonight if we can for a little bit of time. And particularly tonight, as I did a couple of weeks ago, instead of looking at all, all of the book, I, just, I want to look at a portion of one of the chapters because I want to get to the other side of that moment. I want to see what Haggai is saying to them to encourage them to finish because regardless of where you and I are, we're not the people that Haggai is writing to returning from Babylon in captivity. We're not rebuilding a temple. We're not finishing something that we started. But all of us in life, no matter where you are, what stage of life you are, all of us have this idea we want to finish well, don't we? Now, some of those finishing well is a temporary thing, right? Now, some of you may love to read. You may be, you may be read readers extraordinaire. You love to do that. I'll never forget, I had one of my teachers in high school. If I told you who she was, you, you'd know her. She said that she read a book every day. And when I was in high school, I couldn't, I was like, uh, I just one book a year. How about that? You know? <laughs> but she's talking about reading a book every day. So for some of you, a short term finish well is just, hey, I want to finish the book I've started, right? If you ask teenagers in school that are over there in our crave building tonight, they're, they're like, look, I just want to finish the school year. I, I want to finish and I want to finish well because I want to move to the next grade. And sometimes we have longer projects. You may, I'm going to finish a career. I'm going to get to a point where I'm finished with my career. Some of you who are already finished in your career, you're thinking of other things. My daughter's in college, you know that. She's like, hey, I want to finish that degree. So you say, I want, I want to finish well in my marriage. I want to finish well in raising my children. Maybe you're, having, you're raising grandchildren or helping. I want to finish well with that. But really, ultimately, for every one of us, and regardless of where we are in life, all of us, I would say, want to finish well with life. Particularly if we want to walk, if we're walking with Jesus, we want to finish well. So tonight we want to look at that. So I've captured from Haggai's little letter the first nine verses of chapter 2. Let's read these together. Or excuse me, let me read them. You follow along as I read them for you tonight. Here it is. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheolteel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made to you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to Shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations and they will come with, come with the wealth of all nations and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. These verses really talk about finishing well. And so I want to give you five thoughts tonight related to that. And every blank you're going to fill in begins with the letter P so that we can remember, right? Man. 
finishing well, regardless of where we are in life, finishing well, number one, requires a picture from God, not men. Now, men's not meant to be misogynist or sexist, but just an all-inclusive term. When we have a picture that is of our own, picture of, from our own doing, from mankind, from humankind, from, from humanity, it's a picture of what? Nostalgia. It's a picture of the way it used to be. Because that's really all that we really can think of, the way it, it used to be. As a matter of fact, think about this. If we go back to the prophet Jeremiah, which is not in the minor 12, but if you recall the the words of Jeremiah, that passage in chapter 29, which is so familiar to a number of people, particularly verse 11, right? For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, right? And we love that verse, but as so often that I quote that verse to you, I remind you that that verse has something ahead of it that we need not miss. And what does the prophet Jeremiah say to them? You're going to be there for 70 years. You're going to be there a long time, 70 years. But don't fret, for I know the plans I have for you. And when 70 years are up, there's going to be a return. There's going to be a remnant that's going to return. So there's some who died in those 70 years. There's some who were born in those 70 years. And there are some who live through that. So Haggai says in in verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? Who among you were there when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and you saw that thing begin to fall? And you saw the fires. And you were running from your own home. And you were running from the Babylonians yourself. Who remembers what it was like? Who remembers how grand and how glorious it was 70 years ago? At the end of verse 3, what does he say? Look at this. How do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? In other words, the temple you're looking at is but a shadow of its former days. It's but a shadow of what it was in its grandeur. Why is it that he's writing this? Now, if you have your Bible open, I don't have it on the screen, but if you have your Bible open, I want you to look back in chapter 1. It's real simple because Haggai doesn't, he doesn't waste any time. He really gets to it because the Lord tells him to get to it. Look in verse 2 of chapter 1. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying this, verse 4. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, this house lies desolate? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of God of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains. Bring the wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord of hosts. What's the thing? They got to a point. They just said, hey, you know what? We're not going to rebuild the house of the Lord. We're gonna go, let's go build our own house. So we're going to go do our own thing. We build our own houses, and we're just going about our business. We're, we're earning a little bit of a living, and we're just lollygagging around, just living frivolously. And we've just abandoned everything the Lord said. I'm bringing you back from captivity. You can be reestablished as the people in the land, and you're going to have the temple, and you're going to be able to have the worship there. No. God's asking them to remember something. He's asked them to remember the temple and its grandeur and what it was before their eyes. Because what they see now is is nothing like that. And God's not asking them to think of the grandest thing they can think of. He's asking them to see as only he can see. Why was the temple the way it was? Because that's what God gave Solomon to build. He's not asking them to see something in just a marvel of the human eye. He's asking them to see the Lord as the author of, and the builder of that temple. You know, we can build some amazing things as humanity, right? 
And we can do some amazing things with our creative mind that God's given to us. Like, for example, you know that, right? It's the Sistine Chapel. I never was good at art, not good at art now. I can't imagine what it was like for Michelangelo to be commissioned to do that. So much of that on his back. It's an amazing masterpiece. History still preserves what's left of the Colosseum. An ancient piece of architecture. Thousands and thousands of people through its years of use gathered. Even the Parthenon. The Acropolis, that massive architectural structure in Athens, Greece. the, The height of that being this place here, the Parthenon. Let's go way back. The pyramids. The symmetry of those and how those stones were put together. Just creative. Maybe more contemporary than any of those. Westminster Abbey in London. The the amazement of the human mind that God gave to us to be able to create And to build. But here's the reality. Any one of those in any moment can be crumbled to the ground. In any way, whether it's a natural disaster or the the works of man and the destruction of man, any of those can in a moment become rubble. See, the task that was before these people was huge and it was beyond anything that they could comprehend. And it was so much... They had become apathetic or complacent about it because they didn't have in their mind what God saw. They had in their mind what they saw, and what they saw was just rubble. They didn't have a picture from the Lord. They they had a picture from God, so they just abandoned what they were doing. And God said, you need a picture of what I'm doing. I need you to see what I'm doing. And Haggai is calling them to see with the eyes of the Lord. Do you remember what God did through Solomon? Solomon. Don't see it as just some grand masterpiece. See it as the work of God that he did. He's asking you to look with his eyes. Finishing well says, I want to have a picture from the Lord of what life is to be. Not a picture from man. But but with that, the second thing in this is this. That is, has a passion for the glory of God, not of men. Now, you're... Listening guide has a typo because it has an apostrophe S. It's not supposed to be there. When I caught the typo because I changed that sentence and I realized I didn't take the apostrophe S off, so my apologies. It's just supposed to say, has a passion for the glory of God, not men. And all over these verses, Haggai seems to speak to them about the glory of the Lord, that he's passionate about his glory. Not just in the nine verses here, but all over this all over this, even though I, I read it to you back in chapter 1, verse 7. Rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. In verse 9, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, he says in chapter 2. God is always about his glory, is he not? And a life that finishes well is a life that says, I am concerned and focused on the glory of the Lord in my life not the glory of me, right? Not the glory of me, but the glory of the Lord. I remind you, Psalm, the psalmist says in chapter 8, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Psalm 96, tell of his glory among the nations and his deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Splendor and majesty are before him, he says in verse 6 of that passage. Verse 8, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. God speaks through Haggai. This man who may be at the, somewhere around 75 years old at the time. He speaks to this maybe elderly man to remind them that they would have a vision and the eyes of the Lord, that they would see the picture from the Lord that would lead them to be passionate about the glory of the Lord. You remember what it was like? As it was destroyed. Yeah. See what God's doing. 
be passionate about finishing what the Lord has given to you because in finishing well, you're displaying the glory of the Lord. So let's fast forward, right? John chapter 2. The Jews said to Jesus, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. <laughs> the Jews said, it took us 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it up in three days? But what was he speaking of? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus was passionate about the glory of the Lord, not because it was contained in the structure built with stones, but he was passionate about the glory of the Lord because he was the glory of God. So that's why he prayed in John 17, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. How did Paul say it in the book of Acts, chapter 20, I think it is? He said, I make this my aim. My life means nothing to me except for this, that I get to use all of my days testifying of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My passion in life is to finish my days telling the story of Jesus. That's what, that's what my life means, to tell the story. So Haggai reminds them, have a picture that is from the Lord and have a passion for his glory. Thirdly, finishing well lives in the patience from God. Anybody in here want to admit that you're an impatient person? Okay, any spouse sitting beside your husband or wife want to admit that they're impatient, right? That's even better. No. Listen, undirected or wrongly directed passion can lead us into arenas and moments that we might later regret. How about I say it this way? How many of us have a tongue that moves faster than our brain? Huh? I do. I can say that. Sometimes we regret and we wish we could change something. There's everything human about rushing into something without the leading of God. And there's something uniquely divine about being still that we might hear and know from the Lord. That's why the psalmist said, cease striving. Cease striving and know what? Know that I'm God. Cease striving. Be still and know who I am. And their passion had been stirred to rebuild. And then they lost their passion because of opposition. Because it was not from seeing what the Lord was seeing. And he is exhorting them, listen. Be patient with each other and be patient with what God is doing. Not patient in, in slowing down. Because they had already slowed down and stopped construction. No, patience to be able to see that God is using all of them to accomplish the goal. That's why he speaks to the governor and he speaks to the high priest and he speaks to the remnant. Three different groups. The governing authority, the spiritual authority, and the people. And he reminds all of them that you're a part of this together. And you're working in this together. And all of you need to work together for the purpose of finishing that, what God, that which God has given to you as the remnant. You remember how they got to this point, by the way? You remember how they got to this point? They're in Babylon, and, but the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. And now the new world power on the scene, while they were in captivity... Nehemiah goes to the king, right? And says, oh, that I would be able to go back. And the Persian king says, what? I'll tell you what, not only can you go back, I'm going to give you what you need to go back. And when you encounter people who are going to stop you, you're going to have information from me that's going to let you go back. I'm going to tell me that's not the hand of God. Bringing them out of captivity, just like he told Jeremiah was going to happen. And he gives them a passageway back to the land See what God's doing. Be passionate for his glory. Be patient with each other in that you will, you'll see that God's at work and using every one of us. Fourth thing. 
Finishing well has the peace of God, not that of outward circumstances. It has the peace of God, not that of outward circumstances. Verse 4, the last phrase. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 5. As for the promise which I made to you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. What? Do not fear. Now hold on just a second. These people didn't come out of Egypt. Egypt was a long time ago. Egypt was Moses and the Exodus, not these people. Their ancestors faced an element of fear when they left Egypt. And when they left Egypt, you remember this? Under the, under the cover of darkness with everything they could muster up. And their, their robes picked up quick. Got to go. And they took everything they could. And when daylight rose and they got out, and they see the chariots coming and the dust rising. And they get out there and they're wandering in the, in the wilderness. And what do they begin to do? What? <laughs> Right? We hungry. We thirsty. We liked Egypt better. You just brought us out here to die. When they left Egypt, there was a bit of fear. How are we going to eat? How, how, I mean, what's this going to be like? They accused Moses of bringing them out there just simply to die, even though it was God's Spirit that had led them every step of the way. And he had performed wonders and miracles among them. And they wanted to find somebody to lead them back. So it's not surprising that their descendants, who now have come back from exile, have an element of fear. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'd probably be right there with them, all right? I'm not going to be too high and mighty and say, well, these old Shame on them. No, I'd probably be right there with them. And you would too. The last time they were in the land of Israel, some of them were running for their lives. And they were grabbing what they could because they were being taken off to Babylon. Some of them have never seen the land before. Because they're like 20 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. Some of them have only heard what was spoken of long ago by the relatives. I'm reminded of what the psalmist said, speaking of this piece. There's a, there's a psalm. Oh, I forget which one exactly. Uh, I, have to think. I won't remember one. But there's a psalm that's written that God divinely inspired the psalmist to write that is built around this image. And while they were in Babylon, and it says they were sitting by the rivers of Babylon, they hung their instruments, their harps, in the trees. And the Babylonians would come and make fun of them. And they would say to a, hey, sing us a song of Zion. And the psalmist says that they would say, how can we? How can we sing a song of Zion? Our heart hurts and aches for we can't sing a song of Zion living here in exile. They longed to be in this place. But where they were looked a little bleak. No temple, it's not being rebuilt, so we might as well just go on life and try to make the best of it. As they begin to rediscover life in this land, they forget that God had given them a purpose of being there. And the peace that they had from coming back to the land was being short-lived because they were losing sight of what God had for them. He was their source of peace. Not in what they had, right? That's why chapter 1, I just read those verses. You got bread, but you're still hungry. You got drink, but you know what? You don't have enough of that. He says, you got clothing, but nobody stays warm. You got money, but it's like putting it in holes. Ultimately, life is not satisfying for you. There is no peace for you. Why? Because you're not focused on what the Lord has for you. Fifteen times in the New Testament, we read about the peace of God or the God of peace. 
And we've conditioned our lives to just think that always talks about the sin of our life. But I just want to remind you of two of those. Colossians chapter 3, Paul says to the church, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Can I just remind you by reading what's happening in Colossians 3? Colossians 3, Paul is reminding them that they have been raised up with Christ. And just before this, listen, he says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond and unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He's reminding them of what it means to live at peace with each other. And by the way, the church in Colossae is facing heretical teachings, facing people who are trying to destroy them and, and undermine the gospel. So the peace of God is not about being, in this case, just simply settled in the relationship you have with Jesus, but it's a horizontal relationship as well because you are together in understanding who you are in Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. You know what he says there? And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension or all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know what he says right before that? Listen to what he says right before that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I can't, I can't say it without clapping, right? That's how the song goes. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God. This is about reminding the Philippians that you are in unsettling times and you are in anxious times. But I want to remind you that when you pray and you seek the Lord, the peace of God surpasses all of your understanding. Hey guys, says, listen, you want to finish well? Be a people whose peace doesn't come from the circumstances you find yourself because life's going to make you anxious. And life's going to be filled with people coming against you. Maybe because of your faith or just because we are broken people. You want the peace that comes? The peace that you need is the peace that the Lord gives. Not peace that you can find from your circumstances. Bank accounts are going to have some and ain't going to have some. Retirement accounts are going to have some and ain't going to have little. And so on and so on. But let the peace of God be what drives you. Lastly, finish well holds to the promise of God, not of men. I read it to you already in verse 4. I am with you, he says. Verse 9, he says, The glory of this temple will be greater than the former. And at the end of verse 9, he says, And I will give peace. In this place, I will give peace. I don't know what could be better words that Josh would want to hear or Zerubbabel would want to hear <laughs> or the people would want to hear than to know the Lord is with them and to know that he gives peace. They face a daunting task. They have to move forward with the assurance that God is with them. And it is not that God is with them as they obey, but it is that God is with them right now. So walk and obey, not so, be so that God will be with you. Walk and obey because God is with you. There's an old Catholic monk. Wrote a, a book was written about his conversations centuries ago. The title of the book is Practicing the Presence of God. And it's in those conversations that he had that he says, I got to the point that I tried to make peeling potatoes be a conversation with God. That I so wanted to commune with the Lord throughout the day that if I were doing what might be a menial task of just peeling potatoes, that in peeling potatoes I was having a conversation with my Lord. 
sometimes we think the only time we have a conversation with God is when we bow our head and close our eyes because we're around a table or somebody says, let's pray. But have you ever wondered what it's like to just recapture the wonder of his presence that he's with you? That's the promise that he makes to them. By the way, I gave you 12 promises they're not original with me. They're from a devotional from some years ago that I wrote down and kept. But you can look them up. The promise of God's presence from Hebrews, I will never desert you. His protection in Genesis, I am a shield to you. His power in Isaiah, I will strengthen you. His provision, I will help you. His leading. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them in John. His purpose from Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. His rest in Matthew, come to me who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. His cleansing in John, if we, first John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. His goodness in Psalms, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. His faithfulness from Samuel, the Lord will not forsake his people. His guidance from the psalmist, he teaches the humble his way. And his plan from Romans, all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's not original with me, by the way. That's right there from the scriptures. Even if I make a promise to you and if you make a promise to me, we are but frail fallen heads making promises to the best of our abilities and we are sure to at some point break that promise or a promise that we've made. But what Haggai was reminding them is that you can bet everything you got if you're a betting person, then you better not be a betting person, but you better just be one who knows <laughs> that God's made a promise. I will be with you. I will be with you, and the glory of this house will be greater than the former, and in this place, I will bring peace. And that promise to true. He was with them in the rebuilding. He was with them in the period after, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, even though he didn't say a word to them. Even though there were 400 years of silence, the peace in verse 9, in this place I will give peace. He promised, he fulfilled, and the peace that he promised came. Not just then, but comes now. You know why? Because Zechariah, who's writing during the same time, Zechariah tells us that there is a branch that he would send, that would grow. And that branch would be called Yahweh saves. And we see that name of Jesus is Greek for that Old Testament name, Yahshua, which means... Yahweh saves. Isaiah tells us that that child will be born among us and a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. What did Haggai want? He wanted him to finish well. Finish well because that was the task that God gave them for the glory of his name and they did just that. But God knew something they didn't know. The great glory of the Lord was not going to be housed in a temple built by hands of humans. Mm -mm. No. But the glory of God was to be shown on a cross with his hands outstretched for humanity. And an empty tomb where he once laid. And an angel there who said, you look for Jesus the Nazarene. What? He is not here. He has risen just as he said. But let me go back to that cross for a moment. Let me go back to that cross. What did Haggai want him to do? He wanted him to finish well. On Sundays we're walking through Parts of the image of the cross. Years ago, I did a series leading up to Easter on the last sayings of Jesus from the cross. And I cannot help but be reminded as I read this and walk through this tonight that there was that moment on that cross 
where the glory of God hung for the sins of humanity. God with us incarnate, fulfilling what it means that you and I as sinners can have peace. The picture of God, of his great love for us there on the cross. The passion of God for his own glory. There as he hung. The patience of God with sinful humanity to deal with us in love. The peace of God that comes not from anything we do, but from what he did on the cross holds to the promise of God that as he hung there on the cross, he said these words, it is finished. It is finished. You want to finish well? Haggai gives us some insight into what it means to finish well. Three takeaways. They're not even on the screen. I just give them to you there. Nothing for you to write down. You see them. Get your priorities in line with God's for your life. Don't say, hey, how do I match my line up with you? No, get yours in line with what God has for you. Say, let me submit my priorities to you. Second takeaway we learn from the people. Spiritual apathy will lead to a multitude of consequences. And lastly, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. It is finished. Finish well in this life by holding on to Jesus who has finished the race for us, right? He's finished it for us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for teaching us from your word. Haggai was calling the people to finish a project that was very real. It was a structure. It was part of your plan for them. And yet we see in the days of the New Testament that Jesus comes and he stands on the steps and he teaches there in that temple and he declares that he, not that structure, he It's the glory of God. He is the one. Tear it down and he'll raise it up in three days. Lord, I thank you that when he hung on a cross, he said it is finished. And it is because he finished the work before him that you empower your children to finish well as we walk with you. To finish well. Thank you for that. And I pray for every person in this room. That walks with Jesus. That you will strengthen us to do just that. And for those who do not. Who do not know you. That they would. From the study of these scriptures. By the power of your Holy Spirit. Come to the realization. They need Jesus that they might finish well. I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.